Hey there, this is Chipmunk Math. I'm Vince, and in this video, we're going to get the chance to practice our Pythagorean theorem skills on some problems. All right, let's go. First problem, solve for the unknown side on this triangle, right? This is a classic Pythagorean theorem problem. You don't know one side of a right triangle. First thing though, notice we've got a question mark there for that long side. So instead of just giving a question mark to work with, let's give it a letter, let's call it X so that we have something a little bit easier to work with when we get to the equations. So what does the Pythagorean theorem says? If you've got a right triangle, then you can use the Pythagorean equation A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And what do those letters mean? C is the hypotenuse, that's the longest side, right, the side that is opposite that right angle in the triangle, and then A and B are the two legs, the two shorter sides that aren't opposite the right angle, that are instead adjacent to that right angle. So A squared plus B squared equals C squared. For the problem that we're working on here, we see that the side that's opposite that right angle is that X side, and the two legs are the 10 and the 5, so we set up with that in mind. A squared plus B squared equals C squared becomes 10 squared plus 5 squared equals X squared, right? Our two legs squared and added together equals the hypotenuse squared. From here on, it's just a matter of doing algebra. 10 squared, that's 100. 5 squared, that's 25, equals x squared. 100 plus 25 add together, we get 125 equals x squared. We take the square root to get to that x. Root 125 equals x. We can simplify 125 as 25 times 5, so the square root of 25. Well, 25 is 5 squared, so we can pop that out, and now we've got 5 root 5 equals x. That's as simple as we can get, and we're done. All right. Next problem, solve for the value of u. Once again, we're basically looking at that same kind of Pythagorean theorem problem that we just saw a few moments ago. You've got one unknown side on a right triangle. The only difference here is last time we didn't know the hypotenuse, this time we don't know a leg, right? We don't know one of the shorter sides. The Pythagorean theorem says that if you've got a right triangle, you can say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is that hypotenuse, that longest side. So the longest side of the triangle we've got here is the 17, because it's opposite that 90 degree. So we can set up as 8 squared plus u squared equals 17 squared, right? 8 and the u are the two legs, the two shorter sides, so they're together on one side, where the 17 is alone, just squared by itself on the other side. From here, it's just a matter of doing algebra again. 8 squared is 64, u squared, we just keep that as u squared. 17 squared, if you don't know 17 squared is on your own. Don't worry about it. I used a calculator too. 17 squared gets 289. U squared equals 225. We take the square root of both sides to get to U. Root 225. Hey, it turns out that 225 is exactly equal to 15 squared. So we've got U equals root 15 squared. So that simplifies very cleanly to U equals 15. And there's our answer, just like that. And notice how everything came out really cleanly in this problem, right? We had 8 for one leg, 15 for the other leg, and 17 for the hypotenuse. There's a special name for situations like this when all of the legs come out really nice and cleanly and they're all whole round numbers. We call them a Pythagorean triple and we've got an entire extra video on that in case you're interested in it. Sometimes it's a useful skill to bring to tests. It can help speed you up a little bit if you're aware of Pythagorean triples because they tend to show up on a lot of standardized tests. So if you're looking for a little bit more of an edge, you might be interested in checking that video out. All right, moving on, we've got number three here. Which of the two below are right triangles? So we've got triangle X and triangle Y, and we're trying to figure out which of them, if either of them, is a right triangle. So to figure out this, we have to do sort of the opposite of the Pythagorean theorem, the Pythagorean converse. So unlike the Pythagorean theorem, whereas if you knew a right triangle, then you could say A squared plus B squared equals C squared, the Pythagorean converse says if A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right, if that equation winds up being true, then you can say it's a right triangle that you're looking at. Right? You don't have to know that it's a right triangle at the beginning, you just have to show that that a squared plus b squared equals c squared equation is true, then you know it's a right triangle. And notice that c in this time no longer means the hypotenuse, it just means the longest side, because you don't actually know for sure whether or not c is a hypotenuse until you've figured out if you're looking at a right triangle, so c just means the longest side for this Pythagorean converse. All right, let's approach triangle X first here. So if A squared plus B squared equals C squared, then we're looking at a right triangle. To do this, we have to first identify which is our longest side. We'll look at those three sides. Nine is the biggest side. So we're going to have our C is nine. So we're setting up is seven squared plus six squared equal to nine squared. And notice how there's that question mark over the equal sign. I've got that there because we don't actually know that seven squared plus six squared is equal to nine squared, right? We're trying to figure out if seven squared plus six squared is equal to nine squared. So that question mark there is a reminder that you're trying to evaluate is that left side 
side the same thing as the right side. It's not a certainty like it is in a lot of other algebra problems. You're trying to figure out, is the left the same as the right? And then depending on what it is, that tells you what to do next. All right, so seven squared plus six squared. Seven squared gets us 49. Six squared gets us 36. Nine squared gets us 81. So is 49 plus 36 equal to 81? I don't know. We add 49 and 36 together, we get 85. 85 is definitely not 81. So that tells us that we are not looking at a right triangle. X is not a right triangle. And there we go. There's our answer for the first half. Although a little bit of bonus, if you watch the advanced understanding, you know that since 85 is greater than 81, that's the leg side. Well, what would be the legs if it were a right triangle? a squared plus b squared is greater than c squared, then that means that we're looking at an acute triangle because what would have been that right angle has to have shrunk to have made that thing that would have been the hypotenuse smaller than it normally would have been. Check out the advanced understanding if you're interested in finding out more about that. All right, other half of this problem, right? We're looking at triangle Y now. Once again, we're trying to figure out is A squared plus B squared equal to C squared? We don't know yet. We're going to figure it out. Who's our C in this one? 15 is the biggest number here. So that's our C value. A squared plus B squared becomes nine squared and 12 squared, 12 squared plus nine squared. Is that equal to 15 squared? 12 squared is 144, nine squared is 81, 15 squared is 225. We add together 144 and 81 and we get 225 is equal to 225. So it checks out. That means Y is a right triangle. We're looking at something that is definitely a right triangle. All right, moving on to the next one, we've got solve for x on a right triangle. Now notice that this is a little bit different than the previous problems, right? Previously, we were trying to solve for x where it was x was just a side of the right triangle, but this time the x is actually sort of mashed up in expressions and it shows up in multiple places, but we can still approach this in the same way. We've got a right triangle, so we know a squared plus b squared equals c squared. We identify our a and our b, those are the two legs, x minus 3 and 12. We identify our hypotenuse opposite the right angle, that's the x plus 5, so x plus 5 will BRC, and now it's just a matter of plugging in. Now notice, I want to point out that A is X minus 3 and C is X plus 5, so it's not just part of it that's going to get squared, it's the entire X minus 3 that has to get squared because it's the entire A that gets squared. Similarly, it's the entire X plus 5 that has to get squared because it's the entire C that gets squared. It can be easy to accidentally do this without putting things in quantities, but you have to make sure to plug in with parentheses, otherwise you're missing that fact of what the entire side is and you're only doing part of it. So we plug in with parentheses, we've got quantity x minus 3 squared plus 12 squared equals quantity x plus 5 squared. From here, it's just a matter of doing algebra. x minus 3 squared is the same as x minus 3 times x minus 3. 12 squared is 144. x plus 5 squared is the same as x plus 5 times x plus 5. We now expand those quantities, multiplying themselves. x minus 3 times x minus 3. Well, that's going to be x on x is x squared. x times negative 3. Negative 3 times x comes together to make negative 6x. Negative 3 times negative 3, that's plus 9. We bring down the plus 144. On the right side, we've got x plus 5 times x plus 5. x times x, x squared. x plus 5, x times 5, sorry, gets us 5x. 5 times x gets us 10x total there, and 5 times 5 gets us 25. Now notice you've got x squared showing up on both sides, so we can subtract that out, and also while we're at it, we can add together that 9 and 144. So now we've got negative 6x plus 153 equals 10x plus 25. We need to get all of our x's together on one side, so we'll add 6x, and we also want to get those x's alone, so we'll subtract 25. So we're adding 6x to both sides, subtracting 25 from both sides, and now we have 128 equals 16x. Final thing we'll do here is divide by 16. We divide by 16 on both sides. We get 8 equals x, and there we are. There's our answer, 8. All right, next problem, how long is the square's diagonal, right? So we've got this square here and trying to figure out how long is the diagonal. Well, just as it is with this picture right now, it doesn't sort of tell us a whole lot of information, but remember, we're looking at a square. So sometimes it really helps to fill in all the other information that we've got going on here. So if it's a square, we're not just looking at this picture, we're looking at something with a bunch of right angles in all of its corners and fives on all of the sides. So now let's draw on that diagonal we're trying to find, right? So we draw on that D diagonal and we're trying to figure out what's that length? Oh, we start to see why this is a Pythagorean theorem problem, right? We see that right triangle that's there, right? We can focus on just that right triangle, and now we've got clearly a right triangle where the two legs are five and the diagonal is D, that's the hypotenuse. Now we can just set this up as A squared plus B squared equals C squared, so we've got five squared plus five squared, our two legs, equals D squared, our hypotenuse. From here, it's just a matter of algebra once again. 5 squared becomes 25, so we've got 25 plus 25 equals d squared. We add those together, we get 50 equals d squared. We take the square root of both sides because we're trying to get to that d, so we have root 50 equals d. We can break that 50 into 25 times 2, so we've got the square root of 25 times 2. Since 25 is equal to 5 squared, that can pop out as the 5 from underneath that radical, and we've got 5 root 2. We can't make it any simpler, so we're done. 5 root 2 is the length of the square's diagonal.
Awesome. Last problem, a nice word problem, nice juicy word problem to sink our teeth into. Tom is painting a building. He has a ladder that's four meters long. To do the painting, the top of the ladder must be at least 3.5 meters up the wall. What is the farthest that the bottom of the ladder can be from the wall? All right, so it's kind of a lot of things to sort of instantly figure out at once. So let's try to help ourselves understand what's going on. Let's draw some pictures to see what's going on. Right, we've got this building here that Tom is going to paint, and we know that there's some place on that building that he has to get up to. Right, he has to get up to a height of 3.5 meters. Right, the, his ladder has to be at least 3.5 meters up the up that wall, and he has a ladder that's four meters long. But we're trying to figure out the farthest that the bottom of the ladder can be from the wall. So what does that mean? Well, we could slide that bottom of the ladder out away from the wall, and notice that the top of the ladder slides down the wall as we slide that bottom out away from the wall. At a certain point, though, that top of the ladder passes being underneath 3.5 meters, right? We want to be at least at 3.5 meters, so we want to go back to that sweet spot where the top of the ladder is exactly at 3.5 meters, and the bottom of the ladder is as far as it can possibly be from the wall. Now, with that in mind, we see, oh, we've got a triangle going on, right? We see we've got this shape here, this thing going on. So we can say, oh, the height is going to be 3.5 meters. We know the length of the ladder, that's four meters. And we'll just call the length away from the wall X. The final thing to notice is we are dealing with a right triangle, right? If it wasn't a right triangle, we couldn't use the Pythagorean theorem, but it's totally reasonable to assume that this building is going to be at a right angle with the ground, right? Most, most buildings are vertical and most grounds are fairly horizontal. So where they meet is going to be a 90 degree angle. But notice that is an assumption that we're having to make something that wasn't explicit explicitly given to us in the problem, and that often happens with word problems where you have to make some slight assumption that's pretty reasonable, but at the same time you might not immediately know yourself, but that's the sort of thing that you have to sort of get used to doing when you're working with word problems. All right, at this point we've just got a nice Pythagorean theorem set up to work with, so our two legs are 3.5 squared and x squared, sorry, two legs are 3.5 and x, but when we plug them into the Pythagorean theorem we get 3.5 squared plus x squared equals the hypotenuse 4 squared. From here it's just a matter of doing algebra, 3.5 squared becomes 12.25 plus x squared equals 4 squared becomes 16. We subtract 12.25 on both sides. Now we have x squared equals 3.75. Take the square root of both sides. We get x equals root 3.75. We grab a calculator, we punch that in, and we get 1.93649. Now, you could probably leave your answer as root 3.75, but considering the fact that we got that the height we're going for is 3.5 meters, we're probably sort of expecting a decimal answer so that we can actually get a sense of how far the bottom of that ladder will be. So we go and grab our calculator and get a decimal answer. That's probably more decimals than we want though, so let's round to two decimal places and we have x equals 1.94. Now we're almost there but not quite done. The last thing we have to remember is we have to include the units because this is a word problem. We had units for those other lengths, so it's 1.94 meters. That's the thing that we were working with. And we're done. All right, awesome. That wraps things up. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out the other videos at chipmunkmath.com. You might really like to uh, check out that lesson if things didn't quite make sense in these practice problems for you. And if they all made sense, but you want a little bit of a deeper grasp of what's going on, maybe check out the advanced understanding, see some proofs of how this stuff is coming about. All right, see you next time.